Hi, my name is Oliver Mogisi, and I'm here uh, representing the PSDOCC. I can barely say that acronym. Uh, that means, and I have, it's the Pipeline Standard Developing Organization Coordinating Council. So I'm last year's 2011-2012 NACE president. I'm on the volunteer side of the SDO. So uh, I'm, I've, I've, I've taken note that nobody includes the cost of volunteers in any of their um, discussion for the cost of developing standards. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, today, NACE is a member of this uh, group, and I'll be representing PSDOCC today. Uh, first thing is the, the charter of PSDOCC. We're a group of association government and industry representatives focused on technical pipeline standards. And I think the key takeaway is that it's a way to communicate among the different stakeholders. It doesn't have any authority. It just facil facilitates transfer of knowledge and creates awareness about the issues and, and what the needs of the different um, stakeholders are. Uh, it's an infinite, it also provides a resource or, or, or a way it enables communication about recent research um, that could be incorporated in, in standards or in regulation. Um, and it allows for uh, a platform to, uh, for everybody to be on the same page in some way. These are the, the members. So you'll see that it's a mix of, of organizations uh, ranging from American Gas Association to NIST. So uh, and NACE International is the association with which uh, I'm associated. There are also participants, I believe, from uh, uh, research organizations that are not listed on this, on this slide. Okay. Uh, PHMSA partners in some way with SDOs. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about the OMB circular, which I, which I won't repeat uh, earlier. Uh, it also, we believe, saves a lot of government uh, taxpayer money. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, one thing that hasn't been adequately maybe brought forward is that uh, it uses the technical knowledge of industry experts. So we frequently come across the idea that technical standards or regulations shouldn't involve those directly participating in industry. And, and, and for me, that's like saying, well, we want to perform heart surgery, but we don't want somebody that actually works on patients. So there's really no way to completely exclude those that work on these pipeline issues um, to exclude those people from the development process because those are, that's really where the bulk of the technology resides. Uh, we certainly encourage government employee participation in standard development. Um, I think I'll bring up an example later where uh, my own personal experience where we have sought, where I sought out participation from FIMSA and NTSB on standards. So that's something that uh, uh, the most of these associations really uh, encourage. Uh, there's a memorandum of agreement, and for me the takeaway again is that uh, there's no real authority. We just agree on how we interact within the PSD OCC. Okay. Incorporating standards by reference. We feel benefits public, government, and industry. Uh, consensus standards. Uh, those are ones that uh, involve the participation of all stakeholders. So we feel that provides maybe the best solution for everyone involved, but not always for each individual stakeholder because it needs to balance the needs of, every, of, of everyone. It's an open, transparent pr process. Uh, those that develop standards are ANSI accredited in this area. Uh, and Participation by interested parties is, is welcome and, and encouraged. Uh, there's a public comment period on proposed rules. We heard a little bit about that, um, where everybody can participate. I'll talk a little more about that, too. Okay. How should standards be available? The PSDOCC um, agrees that they should be accessible during rulemaking comment periods. So that's something that uh, if uh, all, have, all have agreed that during that time that there's a, there, there's a way that can be brought forward that allows access, maybe read only in some way, so that uh, during that period it is free access 
to everyone involved. However, um, when incorporated, that there needs to be, they need to be reasonably available, which doesn't always mean at no cost. What is reasonable? Does it mean free? Um, does it mean access to read only? We've heard different opinions from different groups. Um, but ultimately, there's a cost of developing standards, and reasonable doesn't necessarily mean um, free of any cost whatsoever. Most SDOs are nonprofit organizations, and this is kind of an obvious thing maybe for those of you that are involved with in, in businesses, that uh, um, no profit doesn't mean no revenue, right? So uh, it means that the profit is reinvested. It means that it's used for certain purposes, um, but it means that it still means that uh, an SDO needs to have a financially viable business model that allows it to exist and sustain over a long period of time. Uh, volunteers develop standards. So uh, I think that we underestimate the value of that volunteer time. Um, putting it on the internet doesn't mean it's free just because you don't have printing costs because the entire development cost isn't just print. Uh, SDO business models vary. So I think we've already seen from those here um, that you know, yeah, every association or SDO has a different business model. Um, some of them allow free access to standards, and some of them don't. Um, and some depend very heavily on their standards as a source of revenue and, in fact, their very existence. <coughs> the common good, and this is a little bit, I think I want to be clear that uh, um, in this case, the uh, P. SDOCC members, uh, they, you can argue about the common good or how one is more good than the other, but in reality the common good, everyone wants safe pipelines in some way. Um, with respect to that topic, everyone's working towards the same objective. Um, everyone wants a technically sound standard. Uh, everyone wants relevant input from affected stakeholders before it gets put into a code. Um, and everybody wants results of latest research incorporated because that's a way to more effectively and efficiently um, protect safety of pipelines. The next topic is respect for intellectual property rights. And actually, M Emily Bremer, I think, covered that topic in a, such a complete way that I could never hope to, to cover. So uh, I, I'm not going to talk about that, um, except that reasonable access doesn't necessarily mean free. The cost of doing business. Uh, there's a long list of things here that outline the cost to develop standards. Uh, staff time, buildings, facilities, uh, government relations staff, uh, staff travel, um, and, and in fact, volunteer time. That's the one that's maybe, I think, for me on being a volunteer that's missing off of that list. Uh, this, these costs, if they're not incurred by SDOs, and then recovered by some reasonable fee in the standards is a cost that will be incurred by FIMSA in some way. Uh, and especially the technical, the subject matter experts tend to sit in these volunteer associations. Um, they don't, even though FIMSA has some very highly qualified employees, um, they're not ones that know everything about the technology for pipeline safety, um, and so that cost needs to be included. I'll use the example of, uh, I, was, I worked on 10, 15 years ago on an approach called internal corrosion direct assessment, which is a very narrow one, single threat. Uh, internal corrosion is a very single threat in a pipeline system and has narrow applicability um, for this approach. Uh, I was the chair. I was careful to include four researchers that had expertise in the area. I had four gas pipeline operators. I included an employee of FIMSA and an employee of NTSB on the committee. We developed that standard on the, on, the, on the airplane. I did some quick calculations for what that would be at, at that time, $200 an hour maybe. I think today's maybe a, a bit more. And figured that that standard probably cost us somewhere between $500,000 to a $1 million to develop. So uh, that's a cost then for that narrow technical drill down area. It would cost half a million dollars to reproduce in some way. That would have to be paid to technical experts instead of through the volunteers at the SDOs. And it seems to me that if we talk about roughly, whether it be between $50 or $100 for a standard to access one that costs half a million to a million dollar developed, that, that that's considered to be a reasonable cost of doing business.
Okay. I, I've already said that we agree standards can be available during rulemaking. That's something that, I, that, has, uh, or that doesn't impact any of the relevant standard developing organizations in a significant way. But after the rule, so companies would bear the cost of obtaining those standards. That doesn't just mean pipeline companies. It means organizations that are somehow affiliated with the pipeline industry. Uh, okay, the common goal. Pipeline safety is a common goal for everybody involved. Uh, consensus standards are the best solution for all involved, not necessarily for each individual involved, but they are a way that everybody has, all stakeholders have an input to the standard developing process, and it's a process that works very well. It's a process that ensures that there's a minimum technical standard, there's a minimum applicability, usability, and enforceability in the standard. By having everybody involved, that it ensures that it can be used by, to, to, to a minimum degree, by everyone that, that cares about it. PSDOCC doesn't have the silver bullet or the answer to this, um, but is very happy to support in any way possible, that's for sure. So, uh, and, and in addition, um, encourages all of the standard developing organizations would like increased involvement, more involvement in the standards development process. That's something that makes the standards better, it makes the SDOs better, it makes, uh, it, it improves pipeline safety in, in some way ultimately. That's all I have.